Uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Peter Flugel for including me here in the uh, lineup, actually well after the uh, lineup of speakers had already been announced, so I appreciate that. Um, what I'm presenting here today is actually the last chapter of my dissertation, which is about this monk, Jinnah Prabhasuri, and what I try to sort out in that is a little bit of a reception history of uh, you know, how his lineage and how the Shvetambar tradition in general had understood him. And one of the striking things that uh, became apparent to me was that uh, actually the Kartargach, the lineage that he's part of, uh, doesn't seem to pay that much attention to him for quite some time, so I tried to sort that out. Um, but remarkably, uh, the Tapagach uh, does take up his story about a century after his death. Okay. Uh, so in uh, Professor Nalini Balbir's extremely useful catalog of the gene manuscripts in the British Library, which I had occasion to take full advantage of this week, uh, there's a note following an entry for a manuscript of a rather erudite hymn to the 24 jinnas composed by Jinnah Prabhasuri that attempts to encapsulate who the author was. It says, this Jinnah Prabhasuri is the famous author of the Vividya Tirtakalpa and so many other works, who belonged to the Kartargach and lived in the 13th and 14th centuries. It then adds that he was a contemporary of Sultan Muhammad bin Tughluq. Another note following a separate entry in the catalog declares that he was a leading monk of the Kartargach. It might be worth sorting out just how and when Jinnah Prabhasuri became the, quote, famous author of the Vividya Tirtakalpa and so many other works, as well as when and how he became a leading monk of the Kartargach as neither of these laudatory statements seem to have been readily apparent to the earliest keepers of Kartar history. In fact, the first major lineage history of the Kartar Gach, uh, the Yuga Pradhan Acharya Gurvavali, uh, that is, I guess, the garland of teachers being the leading Acharyas of their respective ages, uh, begun by Jinnapala, seems to have had its impetus in actively effacing the sublineage of which Jinnaprabhasuri uh, was the second Acharya and which came to be known by the dominant lineage later as the Lagu, that is the lesser Kartargach, or it's often also called a branch or a shaka of the Kartargach, and even one goes so far as to call it a gacha beda, a schism. Further, there are no solidly datable texts that mention Jinnah Prabhasuri's name for almost a century after his death, until a 1435 inscription on an image of Parshvanath at a temple near Chittor mentions that the consecrating monk was part of the Jinnah Prabhasuri Anvaya, or his lineage. With such scanty attention paid to Jinnah Prabhasuri by his own lineage, and in light of an apparent attempt by monks of that dominant line of the Kartargach uh, to write his whole sub-lineage out of the annals of the tradition, we should pause to entertain the question of just when and how he became a famous and leading monk of the Kartargach. Now, Jena Prabhasuri is certainly deserving of whatever little fame has attached to his name, sporadic though it has been. He is best known among historians of Jainism, and as Pro uh, Professor Balbir's note indicates, it's primarily for being the author of the Vividya Tirtha Kalpa, which is a collection of 63 Prakrit and Sanskrit chapters that narrate events pertaining, as the title suggests, to various pilgrimage sites, mainly across northern India of the early 14th century. Uh, most specifically, he's centered in uh, Gujarat, Rajasthan, and the greater Delhi area. Including among these chapters, or included among these chapters, are two narratives of his meeting Sultan Muhammad bin Tughluq, uh, which began in 1328 and ended in 1333, likely with the monk's demise at the respectable age of 72. As a result of these meetings, we learn from the text, Jinnah Prabhasuri was able to obtain a number of firmans, or imperial edicts, that secured the first Shvetambara, uh, that first secured Shvetambara pilgrimage sites in Gujarat, and then eventually general permission for both Shvetambara and Digambara Jains to move freely throughout the Sultanate realm. He even persuaded the Sultan to return a previously plundered image of Mahavir to the Jain community, which was then installed at the Sultan's expense in a new temple in a quarter in Delhi, which he had himself set aside for some 400 Jain families. Uh, initially in an area called the Sultana Sarai, uh, but then later on we learned that he moved them to a new quarter called the Batarika Sarai, uh, which was located actually quite close to the Thousand Pillared Hall, uh, which was Muhammad's palace in Delhi. 
Uh, and that was complete with the new Pashrai so that Jinnah Prabhasuri could remain in residence there and advise the Sultan on matters uh, pertaining to Indian religious and philosophical matters. Now, in the Vividya Tirta Kalpa's narratives, which I should note have no other uh, Indic or Persian sources that corroborate their claims, uh, other than several indications of actually positive relations between Jains and uh, Muhammad bin Tughluq's successor, Firuz Shah, um, Jinnah Prabhasuri clearly indicates that his ability to gain <clears throat> an audience with the Sultan was based on two things. First, his knowledge of Indic religious and philosophical traditions, which gained him an invitation to court, and then translated into uh, formidable skills in debate from which he re uh, emerged victorious time and again. And second, his skills as a poet, which so charmed the Sultan with his, quote, finely wrought verses, um, that he was able to gain uh, the image of Mahavir and several of the Furmans immediately upon reciting these verses of praise and greeting to the Sultan. And Jinnah Prabhasuri is well, less well known today as a master poet though his hymns comprise the great majority of his overall oeuvre. Roughly 100 of his hymns are still extant, though he's reputed to have composed over 700 of them, many of which demonstrate his mastery of Sanskrit grammar, lexicography, and prosody. Among these hymns are a chitra kavya, or an image poem, uh, two multiple language hymns, one is a six language, or shadvasha kavya, and the other is an eight language, or ashtabhasha kavya. Uh, and numerous others that display his mastery of one or more of these kavya alankaras, among which uh, his hymn to the 24 jinnas referred to at the opening was a particular favorite of uh, Tapagach commentators. Uh, Deva, Vilam Deva Vimala, in his uh, Hira Saubhagya Mahakavya, actually mentions Jinnah Prabha's hymn, this particular hymn, three times in his glosses of his own work. He also made important contributions to the practice of ritual, composing the first extensive ritual manual in the Kartar Gach, called the Vidhimarga Prapa, or the wellspring of the path of proper conduct, which is actually how the Kartar Gach monks thought of themselves. They were the, the Vidhimarga, the path of proper conduct. Uh, as well as uh, he composed several works on mantra-based rituals, uh, having written manuals on esoteric powers connected to the Suri Mantra as, and other mantras. And he also wrote a number of hymns to the goddess Padmavati, uh, uh, particularly one lengthy one in Prakrit. Uh, and it's this side of his works that all of the later biographers emphasize as his source of power and authority with the Sultan, much at variance with how Jinnah Prabha himself portrays his interactions with him. So with such political and literary accomplishments, it seems as though the Kartirgach would have only been too enthusiastic to embrace Jinnah Prabha Suri. However, as I alluded to earlier, the Kartargach lineage histories don't even mention his lineage at all until 1527, uh, and that's the Kartargach uh, Suri Parampara Prashasti, and only named Jinnah Prabha Suri himself in two, 16, uh, two works dating to 1618, uh, and then they only very briefly mention him. It would seem the interval between Jinnah Prabha's death in 1333 and the first mention of him in a Kartar Patavali calls for an explanation and leaves open the question of why anyone would have cared to include him at all at that late date. The basic answer that I offer here is that his story had been well known to a certain segment of Jains for about two centuries, namely the monks of the rival mendicant order, the Tapagach, whose increasing power and influence in the independent Gujarat Sultanate, and then, of course, in the Mughal uh, Empire under Emperor Akbar, required them to reassess their self-image as a purist tradition in direct opposition to the Kartar monks whom they saw throughout much of the 13th and 14th centuries as too, uh, too closely tied to political power. Their success in supplanting their Kartar rivals is also indicated at a distinct moment in history when the Tapa polemicist Dharma Sagra uh, excoriated his fellow monks for speaking too highly of a monk of a heretical lineage. And this is actually the part of my argument that I think is, uh, needs most help. So if any of you know about the Tapa Gach history of the 15th and early 16th century, I'd appreciate your help. There's only one Kartar lineage text that narrates Jinnah Prabhasuri's life, and unfortunately, it's undated. Though Phyllis Granoff claims that the text is likely produced within a generation of two of Jinnah Prabhasuri's death, she gives no real solid evidence for this claim. 
The text, titled the Vridha Acharya Prabandavali, or the Garland of Narratives of the Acharyas of Old, uh, tells the story of Jinnaprabha's selection by his guru, Jinnasimhasuri, who is the founder of the so-called Lagu Kartar lineage. And then he retells the story of Jinnaprabha's experience in the Sultan's court, completely reinventing the source of Jinnaprabha's influence, finding his, the source of his power in his relationship with Padmavati and in his command of magical powers. It is most probably composed by a monk from the Lagu Shaka, uh, as it traces the succession of acharyas of the Kartargach back to its traditional founder, Vardhamana Suri. Uh, and it culminates with Jinnah Prabha and gives a highly conciliatory explanation for how the tradition divided under the leadership of Jineshwara Suri II. So it basically says that uh, the Kartargach was so successful that uh, Jineshwara uh, decided that it was time to divide up the leadership. So he gave uh, uh, Jinnah Prabhoda, who became the successor to him in, as far as the major part of the tradition goes, gave him charge of all the Oswal genes and gave charge of uh, all the Srimal genes to uh, Jinnah Simhasuri. So that's their explanation of it. So I begin with it here not to support an early date for it, but rather to hold its date in question. Its narrative structure and the details it gives for how Jinnah Prabhu was so successful at court give us a completely new orientation toward the monk that has strong resonances with two solidly datable 15th century Tapa Gach biographies of him. And I give the basic elements of that, that narrative here, and these are the elements that carry through all of the biographies. So Jinnah Simhasuri is visited by Padmavati and told that he has six months to live. He is then instructed to seek out the son of a Srimal merchant who will be his successor. Once identifying the young boy, he uh, initiates him and he grows up to become Jinnah Prabhasuri, who becomes the leader of his order. He then impresses the Sultan uh, upon his visit by exercising a demon from his wife where all others had failed. Now a courtier of the Sultan, uh, who is now called Muhammad Shah in this text, uh, Jinnah Prabha fends off many attempts to outdo his magical powers or to show him up to the Sultan, all because of warnings from Padmavati, who is always looking out for him. These include both Hindu and Muslim contenders. One is named uh, Raghava Chayana, or, or Raghava Chaitanya, who hides the Sultan's ring in Jinnah Prabha's broom, only to have it discovered in the pocket of one of his own disciples. The other is a, quote, magician of Khorasan, who finds that only Jinnah Prabha is powerful enough to knock his turban uh, out of the sky from, uh, from the position it was floating there in the middle of the hallway uh, by using his own Rajoharana, or the broom. On another occasion, he's the only courtier who can correctly predict how the Sultan will leave the palace, that is, by crashing through a wall. And on another occasion, he makes a fig tree follow the Sultan and give its cooling shade to him for a full five miles before the Sultan finally agrees to let the tree go back to its original place. Finally, Jinnah Prabha successfully regains the image of Mahavir by making the image move and speak, whence it states, quote, may the glorious teachings of the Jinnahs be victorious. May the beloved of the king uh, prosper and be happy. May Shah Muhammad uh, reign victorious on earth and may the monk Jinnah Prabhasuri be victorious. This is Phyllis Granoff's translation. So impressed with the Sultan that he worshiped the image then and there, had a temple built for it and offered two villages uh, to the Jains for its maintenance. Another undated narrative uh, collected in the Puratana Prabhanda Sangraha gives us the same basic elements, though with enough variations that it's difficult to say which comes first. Interestingly, it tells the story of how Jinnah Prabha, accompanying the Sultan on a military campaign, pays a visit to the Tapagach monk Soma Prabha Suri, near the Gujarati capital of Patan. I quote the significant passage here. The blessed Soma Prabha Suri began to praise him, saying that it was because of his greatness that the Jain faith was prospering. But Jinnah Prabha Suri replied, I have failed to observe the strict life of a monk, night and day traipsing after the Sultan, I have no independence anymore. You follow the correct behavior of a monk. The true behavior appropriate to a monk is preserved in your monastery. Eventually, Jinnah Prabha goes on to lead the Sultan on a pilgrimage to Girnar, which so impresses the Sultan that he worships the image of Naminath right there. 
Clearly, the narrative lauds Jinnah Prabha for his actions with the Sultan, which brings so much benefit to the Jain community as a whole, and stops to reflect on the Tapagach's superior conduct, upholding the correct monastic practices. It's difficult to say whether this is a Tapagach narrative or a Kartargach reflection on their own situation, though my feeling is that it's the former because it spends so much time detailing the good that can come from a close interaction with political powers, while the Tapagach monks are stuck in a monastery uh, near the me merely regional capital of Patan. And I turn now to the two dated Tapagach narratives. One is the 1446 Upadesha Saptati, or 70 instructive narratives, of Soma Dharmagani. The second is the 1464 uh, Panchishati Prabodha Prabandha Sambandha, or a collection of 500 enlightening narratives uh, by Shubhashila Gani, which contains actually some 19 narratives of Jinnah Prabhasuri's deeds. While the former text ignores Jinnah Prabhasuri's sectarian affiliation, Shubhashila fully incorporates Jinnaprabha into the Tapagach, uh, making him the student of one Vijaya Simhasuri instead of Jinna Simhasuri. So this uh, Jinna versus Vijaya is a way of distinguishing between Kartar and Tapagach Acharyas. Uh, in one story, Jinnaprabha mentions his affection for Somatilaka Suri in the context of meeting with the layman Jagat Simha Shah in the southern sultanate capital at Devagiri but no reference is made to Jinnah Prabha's composition or the gift of hymns, which I'll get to in a bit. I translate the story of Sri Jinnah Prabha Suri's arrival in Devagiri here. Once, Jinnah Prabha Suri walked from town to town and from village to village to praise the gods. Uh, as the word is Devan, which can also be used for the Jinnahs. Um, he reached Devagiri with Sri Ahmad, or... Uh, otherwise named Sultan Piroj, or actually most of these move uh, Jinnaprabha's time up a bit and say that he was in Firoj Shah's court. There, the faithful expended great wealth on a festival to celebrate their entry into the city. So that's both the Sultan and the monk. Jinnaprabha Suri, having praised the gods at all the temples, worshiping at the Chaitya houses, went to the house of Jagat Simha Shah. There, the Suri worshipped images made of the finest silver, gold, quartz crystal, and cat's eye gem. Then, seeing this Tirtha, that is his house, uh, the monk started shaking his head. So Jagat Simha asked, why does your head shake? And the teacher said, I worship the gods in all the cities, towns, and other places of this world. Worship the gurus too. This one now becomes the greatest Chaitya house. Moreover, I worship the Tapa monks Sri Somatilaka Suri in, the, in uh, Jangaralapura. Now, henceforth, a pair of Tirthas have become the best of all in my mind. Thus, I was shaking my head. By the worship of this Tirtha, the bliss of liberation is attained. Whereof? One, the praise of the Arhats over a thousand lifetimes liberates the soul. Doing it within this lifetime, moreover, is due to the attainment of wisdom. Two, the knower of the dharma and the performer of the dharma, even the producer of dharma, the guru, speaks the teaching of the meaning of the scriptures on dharma for all beings. And three, praise to that blessed guru by whom the eyes of the blind, languishing in the darkness of ignorance, are opened with a pencil of the calyrium of knowledge. Having thus heard this instruction in dharma, and having realized his righteous passion, the honorable Jagatsima performed extraordinary devotion to Jena Prabhasuri and gave to him a vital breath in the form of the finest clothes. Each of these three texts demonstrates a general familiarity with the trajectory of Jena Prabhasuri's life story, his success with the Sultan, and accomplishments as an intellectual and theologian. Both Shubhashila Ghani's narrative and the unsigned text seem to coincide with the original text that I talked about from the Vridhacharya Prabhandavali. Shubhashila substitutes Vijaya Simhasuri in the place of Jinnah Simhasuri, otherwise retaining the narrative that the teacher discovers that he has just six months to live and is thus persuaded by Padmavati to seek out the child who will become Jinnah Prabhasuri. He understands that the plundered Mahavir image is the impetus for Jinnah Prabhasuri's initial encounter with the Sultan, but he changes certain details, such as the original city from which Mahavir's uh, image was taken. Likewise, Soma Dharmagani appears to have been familiar with Jinnah Prabha's own Vividhatirtha Kalpa, 
as he details Jinnaprabha's foray into the southern capital of Devagiri, renamed Alatabad, which Muhammad bin Tughluq had attempted to establish as a southern capital, and to which he had actually sent the monk after his initial meeting with him in 1328. Additionally, all three narratives begin with Jinnaprabha Suri's presence in the Tughluq court as an established fact. Uh, whereas in the Tirtha Kalpa itself, there's, uh, you know, it describes more the effort of getting into the court first. Here it's already established that he's a courtier. Thus, they narrate certain experiences that he had at the court that demonstrate his supernatural powers, which had served to solidify his relationship with the Sultan. Rather than discuss the poetic talents that established him at the court, as the Tirtha Kalpa narratives do, the Tapa story showcased Jinnah Prabhasuri's magical powers, his close connection with certain deities, and his cleverness at courtly repartee. Most significantly, all three Tapa Gach narratives place Jinnah Prabhasuri not in the court of Muhammad bin Tughluq, but of his successor, Firuz Shah, who came to power some 18 years after Jinnah Prabha's death. This is especially remarkable due to the fact that two of the three narratives also pushed Jena Prabha's meeting with the Tapagach leader back from Soma Tilakasuri to Soma Prabhasuri. I'm not sure exactly why they do this, but there must be some reason. Uh, the significance of these narratives is clear in the overall theme within the variations. Each reflects on the ambivalence they feel toward Jena Prabhasuri, at once praising him for what he accomplished for the faith, uh, showing him a pious and power, as a pious and powerful monk, and yet showing misgivings about his close relationship with the sultans. I can't help but see these dates of these narratives, at least two and possibly all three of which are in the mid-15th century, as significant. The Tapagach was slowly becoming the dominant order under a new political dispensation, the Gujarat Sultanate, based in the newly established capital of Ahmedabad. Their final success would come in the form of Hiravijay Suri, whose relationship with Akbar is well known to most Sri Tambara Jains today, uh, partly because of Deva Vimala's uh, Hira Saubhagya Mahakavya. Their need for Jinnah Prabha Suri uh, thus obviated, his expulsion from the ranks of the Tapagach, tenuous as it ever was, would come from the polemicist Dharma Sagra Upadhyay, who greatly admired Hira Vijay Suri and saw no need to have a competing model of interaction between a Jain monk and a Muslim sovereign. The vehemently anti Kartara Banu Chandragani Charita, or the deeds of uh, Banu Chandragani, which is dated to about 1620, gives us a sense that the tenor of the Tapa's success against their rivals at that time was nearly complete. Accordingly, the Tapa Gach needs to lay claim to Jinnah Prabhasuri's intellectual and political legacy, or the need to do that, had so diminished that the polemicist Dharma Sagra would excoriate his predecessors, especially Soma Dharma, for associating with this Kartara het, uh, heretic. As Paul Dundas puts it, Dundas puts it, Jinnah Prabha's status as a moral influence upon a Muslim ruler is thus for Dharma Sagra far outweighed by his general heretical stance. To conclude, right now it might be worth revisiting that note on Jinnah Prabha's hymn to the 24 jinnas which I, with which I opened this essay as a way of marking a second avenue by which Jinnah Prabha was remembered, uh, namely among poets and intellectuals of the Jain tradition who recopied and continued to comment upon his Kavya hymns. It notes, in Vikram Samvat 1652, which is the year that the commentary was written, is also the year when Hira Vijay Suri died. So in fact, the Tapagach connection with Jinnah Prabha Suri really appears to begin or at least has a parallel track, with a note in a commentary on his Siddhant Agamastava by one Adigupta. Uh, this is more conciliatory and cooperative. Uh, this is a more conciliatory and cooperative tapa memory of Jinnah Prabha than I, that I want to end with here, uh, which evinces an intellectual memory of the monk that crossed lineages and was not subject to the politics of formal biographical or hagiographical writing but is only traceable in the respect these monks had for him as an accomplished poet. In the, in the opening to the Avachuri, the commentator writes, previously, the blessed Jinnah Prabhasuri daily composed a new hymn before taking any food. He then goes on to state that the Kartara monk gifted 700 of his own new, lovely, and original hymns, which illustrate such techniques of bellet as yamaka, shlesha, chitra, prosody, and the like. Uh, to Lord Samatilakasuri for the purpose of his students' own learning, including uh, the hymn that Adigupta was uh, about to comment upon. 
He further indicates that Jinnaprabha saw that the Tapa's, Tapa lineage's uh, star was on the rise, blessed by the goddess Padmavati. The story later fed back into Kartirgach lineage histories, as a 17th century Patavali mentions, or Kartar Patavali that is, mentions that Jinnaprabhasuri gave 700 mantras to the Tapagach. While the historicity of this exchange cannot be verified, there is a commentary on one of Jinnaprabhasuri's hymns to Mahavira ascribed to A. Somatilakasuri. Uh, the hymn is described as a demonstration of figurative languages, or a figurative language, Lakshana Prayogamaya which fits the description of the types of hymns that Jinnaprabhasuri gifted to the Tapagach leader. Here the chronology is correct, and despite the absence of clear dates in these commentaries, we can get a sense of how Jinnaprabha continued to be remembered by this rival order, and how that eventually led to him gaining the status of a, quote, famous monk of the Kartar order. Rather than because of his magnum opus, the Vividitirta Kalpa, the memory of Jinnaprabha within the Jain tradition was longest preserved among poets who admired his work. Thank you.